In a recent episode, we heard from Lionel Windsor talking about his new book, Truth Be Told, Living Truthfully in a Post-Truth World. In this episode, we're going to focus in on one chapter in that book, looking at how, as Christians, we can live truthful, godly lives in a world that is becoming more and more technologically complex. Technology is not all bad. You're listening to this podcast through a variety of technologies, but it's hard to know how to live in such a complex world, such a technologically complex world. Lionel is going to help us to think through some of the core issues that are vital for us to grasp in a world like ours. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Centre for Christian Living podcast. I'm Peter Orr and I'm joined again by Lionel Windsor. And this is the second conversation we've had following his book, Truth Be Told. And in this podcast episode, we're going to focus in on one chapter where Lionel addresses the issue of technology. We'll think about technology, but I'll start, Lionel, by just asking you, can you just give us an overview of the book as a whole, particularly for those who might not have listened to the previous episode? Yeah, thanks, Pete. It's great to be here. It's called Truth Be Told, Living Truthfully in a Post-Truth World. A good way to think about it is that the book's in three parts. In the first part, I'm looking at a whole lot of issues that have to do with truth in our world, what it means to live in a post-truth world, issues to do with, well, I start with politics, but I don't stay in politics. I talk about technology, culture, and a little bit of the history of Western thought, talk about our own institutions, and then I actually talk about our own personal lives and relationships and sort of go through that and sort of see that we actually have a major truth problem in our world. Why am I doing that? Not just because I want to depress everybody, (laughs) because I want to show that actually the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ gives us a reason to believe in the truth and a reason to be truthful, as well as a reason to be faithful in the face of major truth problems that our world and even our own lives have. So I look at various parts of the Bible I look at God who is truthful and who is faithful, and I look at that in the Old Testament, John's Gospel, 1 John, Ephesians, 1 Timothy, 2 Corinthians, various places that talk a lot about truth. And then in the last part of the book, I look at, well, what does it mean for us to respond to the truth by believing in the truth, trusting in the truthful God, by repenting, admitting our own sin, and actually living truthful lives? And so I've got a lot of ideas and thoughts that come from the Bible rather than just my own head, about living truthful lives and living faithful lives. So that's what the book is about. It's kind of a mixture of cultural critique and Bible, practical Christian living, all in one package. Just before we get into the specifics of technology, how does technology fit into the book? Yeah, so technology is the second main chapter in my book. So one of the big issues in our world when it comes to this post-truth world, that is a world where people don't even care about truth, is the issue of how technology amplifies and gives us problems when it comes to being truthful, being truthful with one another, having access to the truth. Technology is a problem. It's also a great thing, but it's also a problem. I make it my second chapter because in the first chapter, I just talk about the obvious, which is post-truth politics. And then I go, well, it's actually the problem is bigger than that. And then technology is one of the facets of our lives where truth is in trouble, especially when it comes to social media and the way in which we interact with one another, the way in which we receive information, the way in which we give information. So I want to just help people to understand that. Later on in my book, I refer back to the chapter on technology and give some practical ideas as to how we can better use our technology and not use it for the sake of truthfulness. Okay, I'm going to ask you a strange question, and you're going to have to explain the question as well as answer it. (laughs) Uh, Asimov or Shelley? Okay, yes. And you're asking me that question because that's how I start in my chapter. Okay, so Asimov. I grew up as an electrical engineer. No, I didn't grow up as an electrical engineer. That's wrong. I think about it. I almost feel like I, like I did. I grew up as someone who really liked technology. Born to be an electrical engineer. I was born to be an electrical engineer. I really, really liked technology. <laughs> I loved reading the science fiction of Isaac Asimov. If you know Isaac Asimov, some people do, some people don't. Isaac Asimov loved robots, and he had lots of robots 
and the robots were faithful servants of humanity. That was a very, very positive view of technology. They had these three laws built into them, the laws of robotics. You've heard of them, you know, you shall not harm a human being was the first one. Then you obey orders of the human being as long as it doesn't conflict with the first law. And basically, robots were designed to be faithful servants of humanity. And that was a wonderful vision of technology. So I went to uni, I became an electrical engineer, I worked in technology, solar energy, I loved computers and still do. I wasn't an early adopter of social media, but I was close to the earlier edge of that and was doing more stuff. So I like technology. That's Asimov. That's his vision of technology. Wonderful, faithful servant of humanity. Technology is great. Social media, wonderful, because it'll help us to connect Shelley, who's Shelley? Shelley is the author of The Modern Prometheus, or what is it, Frankenstein? So Frankenstein has a monster. So we always need to make sure that we do that. Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the doctor who, or the person who designed the monster. And it's, it's a romantic kind of gothic novel, which was probably technically the first science fiction novel. And it was about a really negative view of technology, basically. So, you know, Frankenstein creates this monster. He creates a human being. He creates a robot kind of thing. And this monster ends up just destroying him and everybody. And it's just this bleak view of technology. And it's full of fear. And that's kind of also true of technology. And as I've gone through life and as I've looked at social media, it's become a bit more Frankenstein's monster to me than Isaac Asimov's robots because there are these problems and major problems in the way in which the technology does things to us and changes us. So there's these two visions of technology, but both of them are kind of true, but we have to not be naive and think, oh, you know, technology is wonderful. You can't just be a complete naysayer and say technology is always bad because there's all sorts of technologies that we're using right now. We're recording this using technology, you know, and your listeners are listening to it using technology. And they've downloaded it using the internet and probably found it on social media and stuff like that. So I'm glad for that. But we also need to be very careful about technology as well. I mean, obviously, technology has been almost there from the beginning. But the printing press, in many ways, it introduced a step change in the way that we use technology to communicate. Do you want to talk about how that was both for the good and for the ill as well? Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing about technology. When we talk about technology, when we say the word technology, we're normally thinking of the latest technology. So right now, technology at this point means phones or something. But yeah, the printing press was a very important technology. Technology is just anything that humans use to extend themselves and to live in their environment. The printing press, you can overstate it, but we don't quite realize some of the changes in our relationship to truth that the printing press brought about in many ways for good, but also we need to realize that there were some downsides to it. And I'm very glad for the printing press. What the printing press did, it made books available in mass production. And what that actually meant was that more and more people could have access to books. Now, that was actually great, especially because lots of people could then have access to the Bible and have access to the Bible in their own languages. And people could then study the Bible and read the Bible in the original languages and see, oh, actually, the things that have been passed down by tradition, not all of them are actually right in terms of the church. And so in many ways, the printing press was one of the factors that sparked the Reformation in Europe, where people were actually returning to the sources. And people were able to read the Bible for themselves rather than feel that they needed to rely on a human authority. And that was really good, Asimov. (laughs) But also the very same thing People were reading the Bible for themselves, and that's a good thing, except they're reading the Bible for themselves, for themselves. Shouldn't we be reading the Bible for God, for community? So what actually can end up happening is there is a refracturing. So people's relationship to truth, not just the Bible, but to just truth generally, became more fractured. And that was one of the factors that was behind big wars and major conflicts and that sort of thing. So we just need to realize that there's always good and bad in technology. And again, I'm very grateful to God for that technology of the printing press. I'm very grateful to God for the technology of the book, that idea of the book that Christians, I think, helped to popularize really in the ancient world, the idea of a codex book that you'd open up and you could refer to God's word. That's really, really a good technology. But there's other technologies that aren't quite so good. And I'm thinking more about social media in my book 
one aspect of particularly internet related technology, social media is information overload. Can you talk a little bit about that? Mm, yes, this is just one of them. When you think about what are the, some of the challenges that social media give us, one of them is information overload. That is, what's really good about social media and the internet and the web is that we've just got all this access to information at our fingertips. But the problem is there's so much of it and no one human being is able to easily process that. So how does that affect our relationship to truth? Well, what it means is that there's just so much information. How do you know what's true and what's not? I saw something on the internet. I saw it in a TikTok video or whatever it is. How do you know that's actually true? You could say, well, you've got to research it thoroughly. Well, how do you research it thoroughly when there's so much information out there? Social media companies will come along and they'll say, well, we've got a solution for you. We'll filter it for you. So what we'll do is we'll set up algorithms that just give you the information that we realize that you want and we won't give you the other stuff. And as human beings, we have to do that. We've got to filter our information simply because otherwise we'd just be overloaded by information. But then we're reliant on the algorithms to tell us what the truth is. And so when you're on social media, you get this impression that you're in the world, that you're actually understanding. Yeah, people have this weird expression. People say, oh, it's all over Facebook. It's not all over Facebook. There's nothing that's all over Facebook. It's all over your Facebook feed, but you think it's all over Facebook because that's the impression Facebook's giving you, that it's all over Facebook. It's not, but you think that's the world. It's not. It's just whatever thing Facebook decided to filter for you. And how are they making that decision? Well, they're actually not making that decision on the basis of truth. They don't care about truth. What they care about is profits. So they'll care about what you see to keep you hooked and keep you going and keep you coming back for more and scrolling and doom scrolling or whatever. That's what they want because they want to keep you so that they can advertise to you. So they're telling you their algorithms are automatically working out not what's true, but what you would like. And then someone in the next room or on the seat next to you on the bus is in a completely different world being filtered with stuff that they want to read. And so is the person at the back of the bus and the other 5 billion people in the world who are on the same social media platform. They're all in different universes. And so we're all getting different aspects of this truth, but we're thinking we're all together. So it's a very individualizing kind of thing. break from our podcast i want to tell you about our next event coming up in march 2024 on the 13th of march at moore college akos balog will be speaking with us about artificial intelligence ai is obviously being widely embraced across our society you've probably heard of chat gpt perhaps other ai tools and there's a lot of concern about how it's impacting education, other fields. Is it going to get out of control? Is it going to ultimately harm humanity? Should we be alarmed about it? ACOS will help us to think about, as Christians, how should we think about AI? What does the Bible have to say about how we should think about and use this important technology? How should it or how might it affect our faith? We hope that you can join us on the 13th of March and hear from Akos Balog, writer and researcher, as he speaks about technology, humanity, and theology at this event. Hope to see you there. And now let's get back to our program. So I think in the book, I mean, you even go as far as talk about social media manipulating us. It's very easy not to be aware of that. Mm. It's very easy to forget that. Mm. Um, do you want to say a little bit about that? Yeah. So sometimes there's just the simple algorithmic manipulation, which is the idea, a book by Johan Hari that I was reading that was very helpful, helping us to see that basically the social media companies, they're driven by profits because they're companies. So they're using the science of addiction to keep us hooked. So there's a kind of manipulation. But there's also the more sinister manipulation, which is the deliberate manipulation, not for the sake of profits, which is bad enough, but actually for the sake of political ends or whatever. It's actually quite ironic. We're talking about my book, Truth Be Told, Living Truthfully in a Post-Truth World. 
and publishers, to their great credit, very happy for me to say this, the book was going to be printed in a very, 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 very large country in the Northern Hemisphere to our far north and populous, and also a country that's very good at manipulating and controlling information. It was going to be printed there. But through their technology, they set up algorithms, I guess, to find keywords. And there's a couple of places in my book where I talk about this country, not many, just as an illustration. And the country picked that up and said, no, you're going to have to change this, 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 and this. And this is the government, because the printer just wanted For a book that was to be printed in another country, and in one sense, yep. had nothing to do with... Yeah, it was going to be printed in this country, but it was printed for Australia and for us in English. And so that's why the book was actually delayed by about three or four months, because we had to find a printer in another country that would actually do that. But that country I refer to. I mean, why am I shy about even mentioning them? You can tell. And I'm kind of shy because I'm actually got in my head, if I say the word, this five-letter word... <laughs> then it's going to be picked up on some algorithm and your podcast might be deleted or something. I don't, know. I don't think it's happening. I'm not that far down the conspiracy theory road, but I just don't want to flag a <laughs> word. Why am I saying this country and many other countries are actually deliberately manipulate information? Yeah, so it's uh, not just this. Yeah, it's other countries. Not just this country. It's other ones as well. Yeah, there are various ways in which social media algorithms are being deliberately manipulated as well, and we don't quite realize it. So how does that affect how you use social media? Me personally? Yeah, so I used to use social media a lot because I thought I was more Asimov. What I actually do now is I hardly use it, even with email. I actually, I don't need to be checking email all day, so I just completely silence as many notifications as I can, apart from emergency contacts from people. And I just spend my day trying to spend my time with people, the people who are around me, the real people, and with things that I need to read and follow up and write lectures. And then at the end of each day, I just really quickly go through my various books. I just go, okay, I'll have a look at Facebook, anything I deal with there, finish two minutes, look at X, Twitter, a couple of minutes, go check emails, check all the inboxes and that kind of thing. I do that because this is not so much to do with the manipulation, but it's got to do with just I know how addictive it is. And I know what will happen is if I check it during the day, even email, I'll just get caught up in thinking about all the various concerns that are coming in but also the social media, and I can get very anxious about it all. So I just limit it that way. I'm not saying everyone should do that, and some people have jobs that don't allow them to do that. That's fine, but I try to be a bit of a digital minimalist myself, to use a phrase from Cal Newport. Not that everyone has to do that. But But I think what you've done is been intentional and thought Mm. carefully about how you use social media technology. And as you say, someone else might think carefully and actually do it differently, but you've Mm. almost got to be intentional because... Yeah. The technology is so powerful. It is. It's really powerful. We don't realize how powerful it is because it's in our pockets and we can just open it up and it feels like we're in control, but very easily we're not in control. So obviously a book is technology, Mm. the internet, social media is technology, and Mm. I know what the difference is, but what's the difference? (laughs) Marshall McLuhan was a media theorist who said the medium is the message. That is, when we deal with a particular technology we're actually being trained to think about truth in a certain way. So when you read a book, you're being trained to think about truth in a certain way. That is, truth is about various complex ideas that all work together from beginning to end. There's normally either a story or an argument or something that works from beginning to end that you can flip back and forth. You can pause it and have a think about it and go, am I going to take that on board? Am I not? You can Flip back and forth. You can just check it out. You can check things out quite quickly, not completely quickly, but you're also dealing with truth as a coherent, complex, but coherent whole where there's various ideas that all work together. That's kind of how a book works. So that's how you end up thinking about truth. If you read books, you think, ah, oh, there's this side and then there's this side. And then those things work together in a rich and complex whole. Social media trains you to think about truth in a very different way. Social media goes straight for your gut. And so what you do is you just flick through a whole series of completely disconnected or non-connected things. And it's just about emotion, emotion, emotion. That's funny. He said, I hate her. Oh, that's awful. Funny bunny rabbit. You're just going through and you're just having lots and lots of emotions and it just hits you right in the gut without going through your brain necessarily. Well, when I say through your brain, of course it's going through your brain, but it's not going through your rational processing. And it's fast. And so it trains you to think about truth in terms of a big non-connected sort of mosaic of not coherent 
things. That's what truth is about. So it trains you to think about truth in terms of gut reactions. Then you think, oh, that's not so bad, is it? But then when you think about how does it train you to think about your personal relationships then and the way that you conduct conversations? And it's just really, really interesting when you're teaching students and students who come in and are more used to social media are good at finding information quickly, but not necessarily very good at processing or being discerning about it. So we've got to do some remedial, here's how you read a book kind of stuff at college. And they're better than us in lots of things. But how to read a book, how to grasp the fullness of God's revelation in all of its complexity, from Old Testament to New Testament. Father, Son, and Spirit, and how that works together with sin and justification and sanctification, all those different things, which are all complementary things that all work together, but truth is a complex whole. That is probably better communicated through a book than through a medium that is just hitting you with lots and lots of little short things. In the book, you touch on AI, but you don't spend a lot of time on it. Love to hear your thoughts on artificial intelligence and the latest iteration, you know, chat GPT. And like yeah, I actually submitted the book. This is funny. Yeah, the book probably going to be about 14 months between submitting it and it being on the shelves. And so I submitted the book just a week before chat GPT came on the scene. So I had mentioned AI, so I was glad I'd mentioned it. And I think it's just like one paragraph or whatever, and virtual reality as well. That's the next iteration that we really need to be thinking about. Again, it's Asimov's robot and also... Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as well. That is, there's really good things. It's incredibly powerful and been experimenting. I think you have of just using it to do various things. But at the very same time, the relationship to truth is going to be very, very, how do you know whether what you're reading or seeing is being created by a bot or is actually the person it's being represented to be saying? And that's true of text, but it's also true of images and video. And it's really interesting, I was just talking to someone who's not a Christian the other day, and this person was saying to me, well, you know, if God really cared about us, wouldn't he give us some evidence for Jesus' resurrection that was just more obvious, like an actual image or video or a something that is just immediate and we could see, because seeing is believing. And I was going, actually, God's given us evidence that's more reliable. And that is historical evidence for the resurrection that you can actually discern and look at and weigh up because seeing is not believing anymore. That what you see, you don't know if it's been made up. And so seeing something on a video, seeing words on a page that have come just on the internet. So that's going to be a significant issue for us. It's a little bit like nuclear technology. Nuclear technology can do great things. It can also be used to create nuclear weapons. And that's true of this. And it's no surprise that some modern successes to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein are AI based, you know, the Matrix movies and the Terminator movies and Blade Runner and, and everything else, those dystopian kind of ideas. It's all based on AI. <laughs> People have been predicting this for quite some time, but now it's sort of upon us. I'm very glad that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, that he's risen from the dead and that he is true because we're entering a world where it's going to be difficult to know what is true. Not to mention, and this is a whole other area issues of pornography and the way that pornography now is so incredibly available to people that it's actually changing the way we think about relationships, the way we think about men and women and sexuality and destroying people's brains, really. That's already been happening for quite some time. So I'm very negative about this, aren't I? But that's why there's only chapter two of my book and I get more negative after that. But I say that's not the only problem. But then bring in the gospel of the Lord Jesus, which was in the last podcast episode. Well, <laughs> I mean, the whole book is on truth. And I think you've shown us so helpfully how technology, it can be used wonderfully for good, but I guess it amplifies human sinfulness. Mm, yeah. And so as Christians, it's very, very important that we think carefully and clearly about the truth and we have the truth. You mm. know, we have God's word, we have the Lord Jesus. Mm. And so Thank you very much, Lionel, again, for coming on the podcast. But thank you for writing a book that I think is so timely and important in the world that we live in. Thanks, Lionel. You're welcome, Pete. Great to be here. To 
benefit from more resources from the Centre for Christian Living, please visit ccl.more.edu.au where you'll find a host of resources, including past podcast episodes, videos from our live events, and articles published through the Centre. We'd love for you to subscribe to our podcast and for you to leave us a review so that more people can discover our resources. On our website, we also have an opportunity for you to make a tax-deductible donation to support the ongoing work of the Centre. We always benefit from receiving questions and feedback from our listeners, so if you'd like to get in touch, you can email us at ccl at more.edu.au. As always, I'd like to thank Moore College for its support of the Center for Christian Living and to thank my assistant, Karen Bellhars, for her work in editing and transcribing the episodes. The music for our podcast was generously provided by James West. James West.